Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see everybody here today. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Mitch Tomlinson. I'm the president and CEO here. Um, this is our. My glass door rating is a 91, just to let everybody know. Um, it's great to be here. It's, um, uh, for us, we've been doing this for more than a decade, and we've brought in speakers in the fall and speakers in the spring. Our fall speakers tend to focus on areas of disability, and um, in our spring, we really talk more about um, workplace culture um, and those things that make our workplace a better place to work. So uh, we're excited to be in the spring. Um, it is spring. <laughs> It's a sunny day. We have sun coming into the light well in our building today. And um, I'm assuring you that spring is just around the corner. I, I think it snowed every day in April so far. It's just unbelievable. We, we have a cottage. We were going to go up north last weekend, and there was a foot of snow coming down. So we, we skipped that, of course. Um, but it's nice to be here. My notes say I'm supposed to introduce important guests. Um, I wanted to recognize Jeannie, my wife. Jeannie, if you'd stand up. We don't want to miss that. <laughs> we have some board members here from our Peckham board and from our foundation board. If those guys would stand up, all the folks in the room taking time from their busy schedule. Mike, <laughs> Barn. You know, when I look around the room and they say special guest, and I yeah. see so many people that I see every day, everybody in the room is kind of a special guest to me, at least. So what I want you all to do is stand up. Say hi to each other, guy on the right, the guy on the left, the person in front of you, behind you, and say congratulations. Um, I also want to welcome, we have folks from all of our remote locations. So we have folks from Phoenix, Arizona, where it's what time in the morning there? 7.30, 8.30? Um, we have folks from uh, Grand Rapids and Battle Creek and Charlotte on the screen. So everybody wave their hand and say hi to all of our remote folks here. Um, it's fun to have them listening as well. And as you know, we... Um, uh, broadcast this around for uh, all of us, and, and we, we, we pay close attention to how we talk about this community discussion. So we have so many folks from the community, and uh, over the years we've had conversations about all different subjects related to disability and disability etiquette and, and cultures in the workplace. Um, today, I got to, to spend some time with Michelle. We toured our center. Uh, I think the, she came from Texas uh, last night. She brought this warm weather in with us. It's not quite Texas weather, but closing in. Um, but she's done a lot of work with the Momentus Institute. Um, Siobhan's going to introduce her in a minute. Um, but we're really excited to kind of expand this community discussion around issues of trauma uh, and um, what we're calling uh, emotional intelligence. Um, and we'll learn more about that this morning as we speak. Um, last year in the fall, I don't know how many people came and saw Ryan Leaf, the football player, and we talked about mental illness issues and substance abuse. Um, so we're at Peckham, we serve folks of, with all different disabilities, but certainly a, a large percentage of the people we work with here at Peckham have psychiatric uh, issues. They have issues with post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, and certainly trauma touches pretty much every family uh, and everybody that we work with as a company in one way or another. So this idea of thinking about how do we uh, you know, at Peckham, we, we've really been focusing with our core values this year on compassion uh, and thinking about how we compassionately work with each other and make work um, uh, more than just work. Make work a place where you get well and you get strong and you, you thrive. Um, 
So that discussion in our community is important. And, you know, we all watch, you know, I, Jeannie and I have this habit of watching Rachel Maddow at 9 o'clock every night. And, you know, we get ourselves all worked up before we go to bed. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's a good idea, but we feel like it's so important to kind of pay attention to what's happening in our world. Um, but underneath all that angst and all that um, stuff that's going on uh, is a community, you know, and we have a community here in Lansing and Battle Creek and, and Grand Rapids and Phoenix. Um, and we need to think about how we care for each other and we nurture each other through, through our daily strifes. And they're, they're all about us. So, we're excited to take a few minutes out to have people take some time in their day to think about this subject. Um, and we're excited to be uh, offering Michelle to, to lead our discussion today. So um, Siobhan Lewis came all the way from Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, to introduce Michelle today. We're really excited to have Siobhan in the house. So Siobhan will be introducing our morning speaker. So thanks, Siobhan. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Mitch did such a good job of kind of talking about what Michelle was going to speak about. I have short remarks this morning. <laughs> um, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, this program is brought to, you, brought to you by the foundation. So if you're interested in supporting the foundation and the activities, please email us or call us, and we'd be happy to direct you to that giving envelope. <laughs> um, also, we, do, we will have time for question and answers, hopefully at the end of the session. So if you would like to text this number on the screen and email, we will uh, kind of watch for those questions and see how many we have time for today. So I am excited to present to you today's speaker, Michelle Kinder. Yes, she's worth applauding. <laughs> We're very excited to have her. Michelle is the executive director of the Texas nonprofit organization, the Momentous Institute. The Momentous Institute is an award-winning nonprofit that specializes in building and repairing families who have experienced trauma, poverty, and really supporting them with the proper tools and resources so that they can live in their best, fullest potential, which is very similar to the work we do here. She has committed herself to serving families and children. For more than 20 years, she's worked in the field of mental health for children. She's a licensed professional counselor. She's an acclaimed writer with her works being published in Time Magazine, PBS, Huffington Post, and much more. She is also a nationally recognized speaker on trauma, parenting, social and emotional health, and also emotionally intelligent leadership, which is one of the topics that she'll be speaking on today. She has compelling and passionate lessons that really talk about teaching and treating our children with compassion, with tolerance, being mindful, and really no matter where any of us work, no matter what industry we're in, these are all lessons that we can carry into our work every day. So without further ado, I'm excited to present to you Michelle. to be here and I get to tour and spend time at lots of different nonprofits and I swear I'm not just saying this hands down most inspirational tour I've ever had I'm so incredibly honored to be here y'all are amazing <laughs> I am gonna set my timer right now because I get so excited about this topic that I can go a little like crazy. And none of y'all want to be here till 6 o'clock. So um, <laughs> Siobhan promised me she would jump up here and grab me, though, if I got out of line. So let's get started. We're going to talk about emotional intelligence and lessons from the lab, and the lab being Momentous Institute. 
This topic is huge. Tons of people have written about it. It can even be a bit controversial in terms of how important it is. What I want to talk about in this time with you, though, is three lessons that we have sourced from a 98-year history of working with children and families that we know apply not just to children and families, but also to workplaces and influencers like all of you. Does that sound OK? Yeah. <laughs> all right. You're my favorite person ever. <laughs> Will you come with me wherever we go? Yeah. OK, good, good. <laughs> So um, like I mentioned, and like you all mentioned, Moments, Momentus Institute is a 98-year-old nonprofit. If you look at the circle, you'll see that present day, our work can be divided into these three areas. Momentus School, which is a lab school for children who are growing up in poverty, where social emotional health or emotional intelligence is as prioritized as academics. Then if you look at the green bar, therapeutic services, we work with about 6,000 people a year who are experiencing any type of uh, presenting issue, anxiety, depression, trauma, all sorts of difficulties, um, and layered onto that, the struggles that come with living in poverty. All of the things we learn from those incredible families are then poured into our research and training efforts so last year we worked with about 9,000 people in some sort of emotional health training so that they could then go on and help all sorts of kids and families or communities. So that gives you a feel for where these lessons are sourced from. We favor this definition because emotional intelligence or social emotional health can sound a little bit like shop talk, but when you come right down to it, it's just the capacity to understand and manage our emotions, our reactions, and our relationships. I'm just gonna invite you to let that sink in. Our emotions, our reactions, and our relationships. Understanding them, and then managing them. And I don't mean like managing them, because people can tell when we're doing that, it doesn't usually turn out that great but like managing them, being in a relationship with those three things in a way that supports and helps our community. What's this? Iceberg. So if you think about our community and our country and probably the world, that tip of the iceberg gets a lot of focus. It's hyper-focused on, and those are sort of like um, hard skills, uh, IQ, test scores, things people think that they can define us by based on a resume or what have you. But if you look at that bottom of the iceberg, that's the EQ space. That's that capacity to understand and manage our emotions, our reactions, and our relationships. So if it, I'm betting, I don't know, because I don't know y'all, but I'm betting None of y'all had a conversation this week about grades that you got in school or SAT scores or anything like that. Is that a fair? So yeah, but what I can promise you is that everybody in your life knows if you can understand and manage your emotions, your reactions, and your relationships, and they have an opinion about it, <laughs> right? So let's do just a couple quick exercises. Um, think about, the people in your life, maybe coworkers, maybe people you supervise, and picture someone that you are inspired by, that they just show up every day and make the team or the community better. Everybody have someone in your mind? Okay, and so then just test it with this definition. Does that person understand and manage their emotions, reactions, and relationships pretty consistently? Does it line up? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So flip it and think about the person in your life that's like the biggest fun sponge ever and just kind of sucks the life out of you, right? Or out of the team or out of the community. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. Everybody has someone in mind. And test it against this definition. Uh, does that person struggle with understanding and managing their emotions, reactions, and relationships. Does it line up? Okay. 
Emotional Intelligence 2.0 found that 90% of top performers are also high in emotional intelligence. So you can't just have emotional intelligence, right? There's other things that go with it. But this is a key ingredient. This stat is super interesting because they looked, because they thought they could prove it wrong. So they looked high and wide and deep and found that they could not see any job where performance and pay weren't in some way tied to higher emotional intelligence. So it's not just certain jobs that need that capacity to understand and manage emotions, reactions, and relationships. All of us can be better in any job we have if we strengthen that. Does that resonate? All right. So we thought about your high flyers, the people you really count on and are inspired by. We thought about that person that's challenging. We'll keep this clean. Um, now let's kind of turn that same lens onto ourselves. And just over the last month, think about a time that you felt like things were clicking for you. And you felt like you were kind of grounded in purpose and the people around you were getting what they needed. Everybody got a time in mind? And ask yourself if in that moment you were doing a good job understanding and managing emotions, reactions, and relationships. Does it line up? OK. So the less pleasant, flip it, and think of a time when the wheels were off, <laughs> not your proudest moment where you were glad you weren't part of a reality TV show. <laughs> um, there were no cameras. But you were aware that you were acting from a triggered place, and you were not being your best self. Everybody got an example in your head? Unfortunately, I know my list is like doo -doo -doo -doo. too long. Okay, so then test it against that definition. Would you say in that moment when you weren't showing up as your best, most grounded self, were you disconnected from that capacity to understand and manage emotions, reactions, and relationships? Line up. All right. So let's dive in because a lot of people might think, what in the world can kids teach us about being connected to emotional intelligence? And there's a great quote, and I'm going to read it to you because I haven't memorized it yet, but it's from Suzuki Roshi. It's, in the expert's mind, the possibilities are few. In the beginner's mind, the possibilities are endless. And what we have learned from working with children all of these years is that adults have a lot of junk in their heads that kind of mess us up, right? In some ways, we're so busy knowing and doing that we've forgotten about the being aspects of being part of community, right? And kids haven't. And so they really are our best teachers for what it looks like to not have all that clutter getting in our way of being our most emotionally intelligent, grounded self. So you ready to dive into the lessons? Yeah. OK. <laughs> the first lesson is going to be settle your glitter. The second, what you pay attention to expands. And the third, make room, which honestly, y'all don't need any help on this. You're the best example in the world. Make room for joy and play. So diving right in to settle your glitter. <coughs> so we are heavily influenced by neuroscience. We know that trauma and toxic stress <coughs> changes children's brains. And we knew that we needed to find a way to explain this to three-year-olds. That's a big challenge, right? So what we do is we use a glitter ball, just like this little girl here, just like this little boy here. Use a glitter ball. We tell them that when it is all shook up, that's what it's like when their brain is triggered or in fight, flight, or freeze, when their amygdala is in charge. And we ask them, can you see through the ball? Can you see clearly? And they're like, no, miss, it's all crazy in there. It's all shook up. So then we tell them that's what your brain's like when your amygdala is in charge. 
and your prefrontal cortex can't come online. And when your prefrontal cortex can't come online, you can't make your best decisions, and you can't even think about, if I do this, this might happen. So we teach the kids to notice when their glitters all shook up and not make decisions in that moment, but instead develop the skills to settle their glitter, right? And then we ask them, what do you notice when the glitter settled? And they say, I can see clearly, right? So the situation is the same, but when the glitter is all shook up, when the amygdala is in charge, we aren't capable of making thoughtful, careful decisions because we're triggered, right? So, you, so developing that capacity to notice when our glitter is everywhere and then developing the skills to settle the glitter so that we can be our best selves and make our good decisions. Do you want to do an experiment? <laughs> He's like, no. I am not up for that. <laughs> Look the other way. I appreciate your honesty. <laughs> so this one's an easy one. Um, what we're going to do, I'm going to keep track of time. And I just want you to breathe normally like you do and count how many breaths you get in one minute. Sound OK? So you're counting your breaths for one minute. Go. Okay, that was a minute, didn't that? If it felt long to you, think about how long it felt to me standing up here, right? So how, what were, just shout out your numbers. How many breaths? 21. 21, 12, 12 6, 18, 18. One. What about over here? What? <laughs> Who did one? <laughs> Are you levitating? <laughs> 25. Okay, great numbers. 35. 35? I know. I feel like I need to go back there and hug you. That's a lot of breaths. Okay, so. And you got 25. Okay, so remember your number. This is, we're going to talk about it in a minute in a little more depth. And by the way, from now on, I hope you will always come with me when I speak, and I hope the baby sounds will always come with me. This is the perfect room. Okay, so we talked about the amygdala, right? And our three-year-olds, they don't know where to stop the word, so they're like amygdala, la, 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 they keep it going. But they can understand, amygdala is in charge of my emotions. Prefrontal cortex helps me make good decisions. And when they're triggered, when the amygdala is triggered, it shuts down the prefrontal cortex. So let's take a few minutes to talk about what shuts down the prefrontal cortex in our worlds most often. There's two kind of key areas. Can you tell what the first one is looking at her? Stress. None of that here, right? No stress? You're good? <laughs> yes. Stress is a big piece of, the, of what gets in our way in terms of our capacity to settle our glitter. What's the second one? <clears throat> There's a clue. Ego, right? And, and, it, and this isn't meant like, you know, egomaniacs. Like, this is meant the way ego shows up in all of our lives, right? Every single one of us gets triggered by ego, right? Yes? And in that moment, what happens to the glitter, right? And what happens to the glitter when stress 
when we allow stress to sort of take over. Shakes up, right? So if you're not sure if ego shows up for you, I just want to kind of play a few sentences that might pop into your brain at any given day that are grounded in that ego trigger. And then if we aren't grounded in ego trigger and we're more in that space of higher self, what would be some things we're thinking, okay? Just this will kind of make it a little bit more 3D for us. I'm a victim of circumstance. Anybody ever feel that way? Like I'm just, that's, I'm, this, I'm the victim of circumstance. <laughs> <laughs> Stepping in, same exact situation, but getting unhooked by ego and stepping into that sense of higher purpose, we might instead be guided by this idea that we participate in creating our reality, right? We might get triggered by this idea that I live in scarcity, there is never enough. When we're our most grounded self, we might instead be thinking, I live in abundance and I have what I need. Circumstances, exactly the same. I'm not, I'm not talking about things changing around us. I'm talking about how we relate to our circumstances, right? Uh, I'm in competition with the world versus I'm in harmony with the world. We all have both days, right? It's not like, we're not going to have half of you go to this side of the room and half go to the other. We all get triggered by this column of ego. If I don't look out for myself, no one else will. Ever have days like that? Alternatively, the invitation to step into that space of we're all working together toward a collective goal, which y'all, again, best example in the country of that. Once everything falls into place, I will find peace. Ever feel like you're kind of chasing peace and you feel like when these things happen, I'll, I will arrive? That's an ego-driven concept. Alternatively, we can ground ourselves in the notion that find peace and everything will fall into place. The ego holds in contempt, right? So something happens and we think, rah, about that person or that situation. The higher self holds an esteem, right? So that generosity of spirit. And then lastly, sometimes we can get triggered and we can want to seek to divide and separate, but we can be invited to unify and heal. Does that make it a little more 3D of the times we might be captured by ego? Okay. So the answer is on the board. But when our glitter is everywhere because of stress or getting triggered by ego, what do you all think is the single most researched, most accessible way for us to regulate our nervous system or settle our glitter? Breathing, breathing right? And we did that one minute and you counted. Breathing. Well, I was talking to one group and I said it's the most accessible, most researched. And you know what their answer was? Drugs. <laughs> so I had to add free. I'm pleased I didn't have to add free for y'all. <laughs> in our lab, in our, in our momentous school lab, uh, our children breathe at least three times a day. They'll stop what they're doing and they'll do some breathing together to kind of regulate their nervous system and get ready to jump into the next thing. Anybody use apps to kind of develop a practice? Yes? What do y'all use? Yeah, meditation apps? Headspace. Headspace? Yes? Insight timer. Insight timer, awesome. Calm. Calm, that's a good one. Anybody else use? Anybody uh, heard of the 10% happier? That's another really good one. Yeah? Yes. And how about the tagline, meditation for fidgety skeptics? Yes. Best tagline ever. <laughs> so the reason I bring this up is because, remember we talked about settling your glitter is about knowing when you're triggered, knowing when the glitter's everywhere, and then knowing and developing practices to settle the glitter. Breath is the number one way to do that. But if you wait until your glitter's everywhere and you try to do the breathing, You'll, act, you'll probably hyperventilate. 
because you're just not in a state to access that tool. But if you're developing the tool on a daily basis, like we do with the kids at Momentous Institute, then you can grab it right when you need it and settle that glitter. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I want us to try another minute, but this time we're going to do box breathing, which is used by the military and several sports teams. And basically, we'll inhale for four seconds, and we'll hold for four seconds. We'll exhale for, and then hold, and then do it again. So do we have any math geniuses in the room of how many breaths we'll end up doing in one minute? Four. Okay, so your nervous system will thrive on about four to eight breaths a minute. So remember, do you remember the number you had earlier? 20, right? So that's okay. We're, you just begin to build moments into your day where you're aware of how quickly you're breathing and you begin to practice slowing it down. And even if you just notice you're breathing too fast and you don't even change it right then, you're actually changing your brain, just noticing it. So it, it's a long path from not being aware at all to actually slowing your breath down throughout the day. And each part of the path will begin to get you there, okay? So you wanna try this? <laughs> I need to stop looking at you when I ask questions. <laughs> it's not working out for me. <laughs> okay, so uh, go ahead. When we switch the slide, just follow the ball up and it'll start with an inhale. Okay, so um, did you notice what happened in the room? Did you notice kind of the energy of the room even shifted with the slower breathing? How did that feel for y'all? For some good? Was it anxiety provoking for anyone? Yeah, especially the holding, yes, yes. <clears throat> if you feel, if you're wanting to play around with this and you feel that sort of anxiety building, then rather than do the four hold, four hold, um, sometimes all I can do is just uh, sit and breathe and I just say to myself, sit and know you're sitting. And I'll just repeat that until that feels real to me and I've actually dropped back into my body from whatever's making me anxious. And then I'll do in, uh, breathing in, I know I'm breathing in. Breathing out, I know I'm breathing out. And I just do that until I feel sort of settled in, and then I can do different, different types of breathing. But that's a good place to start if you feel anxious. All right, I want to show you a one-minute video of a four-year-old uh, named Faith. And she is at our school, and so by, when we did this video, she had been doing regular breathing practices for about a year and a half. So I want you to watch her and think about how much happened for her in that time in terms of her capacity to notice when she was having a difficulty and pick a tool, apply the tool, and then that tool jumped her back in in a different way, okay? So kind of pay attention to those things when you watch her. scared or frustrated. Take a deep breath. We gotta breathe on center. We take deep breaths slowly out. Her first 
smart or frustrated, I tell her to breathe. I was trying to launch some letters, and it got really frustrated. And I need to take a deep breath. And I almost got it. I almost got it by myself, and I felt just a little happy. Isn't she great? So, um, did you did you track on that that she had a frustrating moment like the same kind that all of us have on any given day when stress or ego are triggering us? But instead of going into like a victim stance or expecting someone else to solve her problem, she had the skills because she'd been practicing for a year and a half to notice take some deep breaths, and then plug back in with her glitter settled, right? So before we jump into the next lesson, what was the lesson one? Settle your glitter. Settle your glitter, you got it. All right, so the next lesson, uh, what you pay attention to expands. So this is, I honestly, I just try to develop a talk where I get to say quantum physics one time. So this principle, just kidding. Um, this principle is from quantum physics, that idea that even at a molecular level, what you pay attention to expands. And that also happens in the workplace, right? So if something goes wrong and I get hyper-focused on that, guess what gets bigger? The problem and the stress, right? But if we can train our brains to pay attention to exceptions, or pay attention to the, the good stuff that's happening. Guess what happens to those things? They, they actually get bigger because we're focusing on them. I'll give you an example from our therapy lab. If, if one of our therapists is working with a family that's having a lot of trouble, they're screaming at each other all the time, they'll sit with them, hear how the week was, and maybe traditional therapy, you would unpack the worst incident. Maybe there was, you know, things escalated to a point where it was a safety concern. We attend to that for sure. But what's different in our therapy offices is the therapist will listen for maybe Wednesday at 6 o'clock for two minutes. They were attuned to each other and listening and felt cared for. So they'll spend a good bit of the session asking about that exception, right? Tell me what was happening when you all were connected. And when was the last time you felt that way? And how do you think that came to be? And what would we need to do more of to get that to grow? So do you, do you feel how big the pull is for all of us to focus on what isn't working? It's huge, right? Our, our culture demands attention on problems. So it's a superpower to be able to attend to the problems while simultaneously understanding that what you pay attention to expands. The first thing, though, that I want to kind of grapple with with you all is this idea that we are never attending to everything. So there's tons of stuff going on in our environment at any given moment, and we only pick up a very small percentage of what's happening, and then we call that truth or reality, right? And then we make our decisions based on what we think is truth or reality. So to illustrate my point, I'm going to show you a short video, and if you watch closely, you're going to be able to tell if the detective picked the right murder suspect. Okay? <laughs> Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. But, but, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. 
It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? So what did you notice? Did, were you able to tell if he got it right? Yeah. You were? Did he get it right? No. Yeah. <laughs> no, he got it wrong. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, I had the same exact feeling when I watched the video. I had no idea. And I definitely didn't notice what I'm about to share with you. Take a look. Uh, clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. <laughs> I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Well, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. <laughs> That's humbling, isn't it? Right, so tons and tons and tons of stuff happens around us all day long and we don't pick up on it, right? So not only what you pay attention to expands, but we have choices about what we pay attention to and we are never grabbing the whole picture, okay? So the point being, we, we have to hold our truth with a capital T lightly because any, any little thing that we're not picking up on, if we allow it to, could shift our view, right? And it could put us in a position of more generosity of spirit with our peers and our colleagues and our bosses, right? It could make us more, um, more accessible and it can definitely help us manage our emotions and our reactions and our relationships if we recognize that whatever has got us triggered, whatever's got our glitter everywhere, may not be the whole picture, right? So what you pay attention to expands. Um, if you look at this little ball of light, there's a meditation teacher called Dandapani. And does anybody follow his work? So he's got an amazing 12-week course out right now that you can access online that is one of the best things I've ever experienced. And one of the things he talks about is this little ball of light. And he talks about that your awareness, the metaphor is the ball of light, your awareness is the ball of light, and you can begin to develop the capacity to control where it goes. So he would challenge us that when we say, I'm mad, that that's not an ideal way to think about it. He would say your awareness is on the mad. It's tricky language, but he uses the metaphor like if, say your house, right? You have a kitchen, you have a bathroom, you have a living room, right? You have a front door. You move through your house, right? I'm gonna move into my living room, I'm gonna move into my dining room. The house doesn't move. It's the same with our minds. So there's the mads in there, but the happy's in there, and the sad, and the thoughtful, and the concentrated, and the all, all of it. There's a thousand rooms in here. And we can develop the capacity to let this little light, our awareness, settle where we want it to. So I don't know about you, but if I get triggered, if stress and ego are in charge, then I I set that little butt ball of white light right on my indignation, right? Right on whatever I think is wrong and shouldn't have been done. And then I just let it grow, 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 grow. So what he would challenge us to do is move the light. Like develop the skill to move that ball of light over to something else that's more useful to you, that serves you. So instead of keeping my light right on that indignation and how could they, I can move it over to maybe a spot in my brain that's thinking about what might I, like what might I do differently to shift this relationship? Or I might move it into a space of, uh, of understanding like, ooh, I know that they just had a loss in their family and maybe that's why 
they uh, are acting the way they're acting. Does that make sense? So the capacity to develop the ability to move our awareness around will shift our relationship with the ability to understand and manage emotions, reactions, and relationships. This works really well if you're having trouble falling asleep. Does anybody have trouble falling asleep? Yeah, because your mind's going crazy, right? So if you, if, if you can maybe try, start practicing with this idea when you're having trouble going to sleep of where do I want to move the light? Where do I want to move this little ball of light? I'm going to move it over into a space of gratitude maybe, or peace, or um, excitement for what I'm able to do the next day, and move it away from whatever's keeping me awake, okay? Does that resonate? All right. So this next idea comes from Tina Payne Bryson and Dan Siegel. Anybody know their work? Uh, terrific, terrific people. Um, if any of y'all are raising children, they wrote The Whole Brain Child and No Drama Discipline. Extraordinary books will change your life as parents. One of their concepts is this idea of a river of well-being. And they say that we can think about ourselves as being in a little boat in the middle of a river. And if we can keep the boat in the middle of the river, then people experience us as, there's an acronym, it's FACES, flexible, adaptive, coherent, energized, and stable. That sounds pretty good, right? But when we're not in the middle of the river, they say don't think of it as a failure, don't think of it as like a problem. Think of it as that you're bumping up against the banks of either chaos or rigidity, okay? So ideally, we're right in the middle of the river and people are experiencing us as flexible, adaptive, coherent, energized, and stable. But when we're not, we just are bumping up against a bank. So out of curiosity, because people tend to do one or the other, most of us, when things aren't quite right, we go, rigid or we go chaotic and then some people go rigidly chaotic <laughs> right so who who goes rigid raise your hands if you tend to get rigid when things aren't going your way or going quite right and who goes chaotic okay and who are the rigidly chaotic <laughs> yeah i see you i knew you were <laughs> just kidding so what's useful about this, and it can even be useful in the way you all talk with each other about how things are working in teams, right? So like we're not in the middle of the river right now. How do we get back there? What you pay attention to expands. How do we get back to the middle of the river? Um, I am aware of time, so I'm going to zip to number three. So tell me what number one was. Settle, Settle your glitter. Number two. What you focus on may expands. And number three, and truly, like, I heard about the Music Fridays. I saw the bike. Uh, like, I heard 50 different examples in just the hour I was here of the way that you all as an organization make room for play and joy. So this is preaching to the choir. But the research is very clear, getting clearer, that as adults, we can have the mindset that this isn't the time for play and joy. But organizations and people who make space for that are more innovative, they're more creative, they do better abstract thinking, they're better problem solvers. It's a huge retention and recruitment tool. Raise your hand if, you, if part of why you love being part of the Peckham community is the fun and joy and, yeah. Yeah, I could totally feel that walking around. It's very apparent. So little Albert Einstein quote, play is the highest form of research because it puts us in a brain space where we're actually open and we can see things we can't see when we're in that more structured, rigid place. Remember the video, all the things we might not be seeing? But when you step into a head space and a heart space of play and joy, you see more things and you have more capacity to learn and innovate. Let's talk about some things that might keep us from bringing in more play and joy into our lives, okay? This is a 
troubling picture for some people. I get that. Um, I'm in your subgroup. Just look away. Um, this, this is about a research study. And the, I, I can talk to you about it this deep, and then I'm immediately out of my depth. But what I want you to focus on is the metaphor from the research study. Uh, they had mice. And the mice are very playful, doing their thing, playing, playing, playing. The researchers put into the little cage one single cat hair. One single cat hair. Guess what happened? Good, good guesses. The play stopped. One single cat hair completely paralyzed the joy and play in this little mice community. <laughs> Um, so there <laughs> things you never thought you'd say. Um, so they leave the cat hair in. I can't remember the particulars. It's something like six days. Then they take it out, and then they keep observing the mice. What happened? What do you think happened? Good guess. That's what I would have thought, too, that they started playing or that they slowly regained that play and joy. They didn't play. So even though that stressor was removed, they still let it control their capacity for joy or play. So my question to you, for you to think about, is what is your cat hair? <laughs> yeah? Like what are you allowing to suck the joy and play out of your life even when it's not there anymore? because you've empowered it to that degree. Everybody have something in mind? Ooh, I know I do. OK. <laughs> You're my cat hair. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, OK, so this, this next idea is another thing that we can do to increase our capacity for play and joy. And that is raise our awareness, connected to lesson number two, about our triggers. Like what are the things in your life that set you into that more rigid state where you don't feel joyful and playful? Okay, so I'm just gonna give you like 15 seconds to think of one or two, three triggers that you know if I'm going into this situation, I need to be on red alert because I give this a lot of power. Everybody have something, at least one? If you don't, think back to your family of origin and like Thanksgiving and Christmas and stuff. <laughs> and you'll immediately have one, I promise. So the, 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 the practice is knowing what it is and doing some thinking about why you give it so much power. Right, because there's a whole lot of people walking around this universe not thinking about that at all. And so it becomes a superpower to think about, these things trigger me, I know they do, so what do I need to do for myself to minimize their impact on me, okay? Instead of feeling like they own you. A lot of people are like, this is just the way it is? or it's my personality, right? But what if instead you kind of raised up and thought about, I'm right now that trigger has a 10 hold on me on a one to 10 scale. Over the next six months, I'm gonna actively move that to a nine. Like don't even worry about getting it to a one, you'll quit day two, right? Just bring it down the scale a little by little and you'll, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at your capacity to change your relationship with the triggers. The triggers probably won't go away. Again, Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, but you can change your relationship with the triggers, which will change what happens to your glitter, right? So that's still there, but maybe I've got a little buffer around me. Maybe I ate more protein. I don't know what it is. Whatever it is that helps you navigate it so it just doesn't quite get to you like it used to. So again, I've seen this in just an hour being here with you all earlier this morning, but making room for play and joy is not just an individual endeavor. It's, a, it's an issue of mood contagion, 
All right. Have you ever noticed that whoever's around you impacts your nervous system and your mood? And can you think of a person that anytime they walk in the room, it automatically lifts the spirit in the room? I think you're like that. I just, I'm, I'm betting that. So you got someone in mind, right, who does that for, for the room? That's that mood contagion. What about the person that you, it might be like the best party, best work meeting ever, and someone walks in the room and it's just like, <laughs> like no oxygen left, right? That's mood contagion. So not only do we have to pay attention to this capacity for fun and play and joy for our own benefit, but we have to do it because it impacts the capacity of the people around us to achieve their full potential. Um, this is especially speaking to those of you in the room who are leaders, and, and I define that widely. I define it as um, do, you, do you have impact on people, right? Do you influence people? Traditionally, leaders think of themselves as like walking into a room taking the temperature like a thermometer and then reacting or responding in a leaderful way, right? What I would argue is that we can actually instead think of ourselves as like chief tone setters, right? As the thermostat. Ther what, how do you say it? Thermostat. It just happened. Is there a doctor in the house? I mean, I just had a stroke. in Spanish at the same time and every so often like my words will just go super funny and I'm it's either stroke or second language thing I don't know anyway thermostat thermostat so imagine if everyone in this room instead of thinking of themselves as walking into a situation taking the temperature and reacting began to think of themselves as having the capacity to walk into a situation and impact the tone, impact the temperature. The way that I walk into this room is going to change the degrees, positive or negative. So how do I want to impact the people around me? Does that resonate? All right, so we've talked about, what was the first one? Settle your glitter. We talked about paying attention to expands, what you pay attention to expands, and then the third one? Make room for joy and play. So what do you think your capacity to move the needle on any of those is if you're running on empty? What do you think? Gas. <laughs> you need gas. <laughs> you need gas. It's exactly right. Like, you, the car's not going anywhere without the gas. Exactly right, and that's true of us as human beings too. You will wear yourself out trying to settle your glitter or stay in the middle of the river or bring your awareness to what's positive and expand it or bring in more joy and play. You will wear yourself out if you aren't also taking care of yourselves, okay? So it's that concept of you can only give what you have. So if I'm running on empty, do you think I have the capacity to walk into a room and set a positive tone? No. And I might think I am, and y'all might think you are, but actually when we're in that state, we are leaking and we are fraying, and it is impacting the people around us. So quick thing, think about your top five. Five things, and it's okay if you only get one or two, but. See if you can begin to de develop out a list of five things that personally fill your tank, that make you feel better. Um, you know, it might be exercise, it might be a certain friendship, food, very good one. Gin and tonic is on my list. I do not want to be judged, but that's real. Like whatever it is, you need your five, and you need to know what they are because once the tank is on empty, you cannot, at that point, think about your list, right? You gotta know what they are, and when you start getting into that half tank place, you know the generation that was always like, don't get your tank below half. Maybe that's real in the North all the time, is it? Is it? Yeah, okay, so, sorry. <laughs> anyway, so 
when it starts getting into that below the half mark, you go to your list and you go, I do not feel like running any more than I feel like anything, but I know I need to do it or I know I need to call this friend, whatever's on your list. So take 20, 30 seconds, see if you have a list or if you need to develop one. I'm super curious, like who, who was it real easy for? You were like, oh, I got my five, I do this all the time. Yes, for several of you. How many of you were like, I got one or two and then that's about it, I need to develop more, a few more? How many of you like want to run out of here and go to the spa because you <laughs> recognize you stink at this? <laughs> like, okay, okay, right. okay, so all right. So, so it's a work, all of this is a work in progress. But just maybe challenge yourself over the next few weeks to develop that list and then see if you can build it in daily or weekly. Um, a tool that I use that has transformed my capacity to do this is an app called Productive. And I don't use it for anything work related. I only use it for things that fill my tank. But it's, you know, you, you put in there things you wanna do daily or weekly and then when you do it, you get to swipe right, like I'm happily married, it's the only swipe writing, swipe writing I'm doing. But you get that sort of like good feeling of like I did that today, I did that today, right? And then the other thing it allows you to do is get a streak, which I don't know if you're as shallow as me, but for me, not breaking my streak is everything, right? So like currently I'm on a meditation streak and a running streak and a yoga streak and it, I almost never want to do it but I want to not break my streak more. So use those mind tricks on yourself to prioritize your own well-being, okay? All right, this is gonna be on you. What was the first one? Settle your glitter. Settle your glitter. Second one? Nice. And number three? Love it. So those three lessons from the lab, and I'm going to leave you with just a quote, tying it all together. This is from Marianne Williamson. She says, we are all meant to shine as children do. As we let our own light shine, we give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Thank y'all so much. We, we've got time for one question. <laughs> Can repeated hardships causing intense grief cause brain damage? Mm, mm, that's such a good question. Okay, so repeated hardships causing intense grief. Yes, so those experiences in our life, especially early on, can absolutely change our brains. I wouldn't call it brain damage, but I would say it changes our brains, and we know that to be true. But we also know that you have neuroplasticity your whole life and you can change your brain in a helpful, healthy direction regardless of what experiences you had or continue to have. And some ways to rewire your brain even in the face of those ongoing incredible challenges and ongoing grief uh, is to uh, ensure you're feeding that belonging, that sense of belonging and connection. Like do you have a trusted person you can talk to? Are you part of a trusted community? Uh, are you taking care of yourself? Those things we know also rewire the brain in a positive direction, even if you've had a lot of hardship and a lot of grief. And another piece of that is how do you take that and transform it into something you can offer the community? So I'm convinced it's the people who have gone through difficulties that are our most amazing resources in this country because there's a texture that comes from trauma and I'm not suggesting woohoo 
glad we go through stuff. I'm not suggesting that. But because we go through stuff, we can translate that into a kind of texture that allows us to show up in our community in a much wiser, more grounded way. And our community needs that kind of leadership right now. So I would, I would encourage you also to think of it with that lens. And one last thing. Uh, in, in the psychology world, there is what happens to us, and then there's the sense we make of it. Sometimes we get obsessed with just the, the event or the thing that happened to us, but our well-being, uh, our capacity to rewire our brain for good, is actually more tied to the sense we make of it. So do the work to make sense of whatever you went through and when you have a coherent narrative, that is going to be your path to healing. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> thank so you. So thank you so much. Oh, for thank that. You so much.